The federal government and the state governments are using laws aimed at fighting terrorism to counter unwanted reporting. Are we back to the era of the reform of 1984? Uh, it seems we are, uh, it, and it doesn't make sense to any discerning citizen that uh, the states and federal government will throw up these laws. I mean, journalists are not terrorists. Uh, uh, there are existing laws in the country. If you feel that whatever is written against you is not appropriate, the courts are there to go to court. But to charge journalists and citizens because of what they write or what they say, to charge them for terrorism, to uh, liken them to those who have taken up arms against the state, is quite troubling. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we've seen this in the past, it's nothing new. I think for me, it's about uh, time citizens rose up to the challenge to confront this monstrosity that is uh, staring us in the face. What do we do? And people are doing a, lum a number of things. Uh, in Lagos, uh, next week, Thursday, we're having a conversation. There is a colloquium uh, on the shrinking uh, media and civic space in the country. Young people uh, are coming around from different parts of the country, professionals, civil society activists, lawyers, and so on, you know, to debate not just to have this conversation, but to uh, explore what citizens can do. We need to do a lot to put an end, uh, an, an end to this. It's not right, it doesn't make sense, but uh, w what do you expect for a government that has uh, very little interest in the welfare of citizens of this country, that has uh, very little interest in the development of the society, the country itself. It appears that this is the only alternative to keep people in check, but I don't think it's something that can survive for too long. You've closely monitored and watched uh, Agba Jalingo's uh, trial. Uh, just yesterday, the Times uh, International Magazine listed uh, uh, Agba Jalingo's trial as one of the top 10 most urgent and severe cases of threats to press freedom around the world. I mean, injustice seems to be deepening. Uh, asking mm -hmm. Max, uh, the, and the, 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 the role the judiciary is actually also okay. playing in this, uh, uh, in this impunity. What's your view on the that? that? That's the also worrisome uh, part of this, you know. The feeling always is that people will do what they want to do. And when I say people, the state, uh, those in power. It, but the expectation is that the judiciary would step in and do the right thing. But it's the judiciary. But, it's the judiciary. It, yeah, but that's, as I said, that's the troubling aspect that even when uh, the, the state, the executive arm of government uh, overreaches itself, there's really nobody to... Uh, put it in check. Uh, the judiciary appears to be uh, overwhelmed, cowed by uh, the executive arm of government, and they are always pandering to. And I remember a few weeks ago when the Shogore case came up and he was granted bail. That was a discussion. My comment was that this is as good as not granting him bail by putting this kind of conditions. It's almost clear that uh, so. It's another way for the judiciary saying we don't want to uh, allow this guy to go, uh, but at the same time, or rather, we don't want to appear to be supporting the, uh, the executive arm of government, but at the same time, make it impossible for him, knowing that these are bill conditions that uh, couldn't be met. And then, subsequently, you now vary the bail condition. So why did you, if you had the power to do this in the first place, why did you put uh, bail conditions that appear almost impossible for, uh, for him to meet? Going back to the Abba, Abba Jalingo case, you see how when he's brought to court, he's cold, he's, and then there is this aspect of uh, 
uh, the case where you say those who are going to stand as witness against him are going to be upgraded and, right. and, and so on. So <laughs> Exactly. Let, let, let's get your perspective on the, the court itself granting anonymity to the witnesses yes, yes. testifying against Jalingo. I mean, isn't that it, ridiculous? Yeah, it, it is. It is. And, but that also shows you how preposterous these case, charges are. Because if these people have the courage of their conviction, they would have this an open trial, let people come in there, give evidence, and uh, provide the necessary materials to prosecute their case. But to now go to this new level of saying the witnesses have to be protected, and it's, it's a dangerous uh, arena we found ourselves, and we don't know what next uh, it's going to happen. But I, I'm comforted by the fact that as citizens, as journalists, we are rising uh, we are rising to the occasion uh, across the country. People are uh, beginning to understand the senselessness of all of this, but not just that, the need for them to take, to take action and confront uh, this monster that we currently face. One of, the, one of these renowned uh, journalists, uh, Richard Akiola, mm. took uh, the NUJ and the Guild of Editors to task when he said that they are sleeping or overdosed on Valium 5. I mean, shouldn't the NUJ and the guild of editors be at the forefront of this? Uh, you, you're perfectly right. And interestingly, uh, yesterday there was a conversation again uh, as part of a coalition of uh, media and whistleblower uh, organizations. And the president of NUJ was there. A number of people raised the issue that what is the NUJ doing. I mean, the president tried to defend the union to say that uh, the union is doing behind the scene, taking actions behind the scene, and uh, people were wanted those actions to be made public uh, for the union to be uh, more visible in term and proactive in terms of the kind of actions it, it takes uh, to protect journalists. The danger is that you think you are safe today. By the time they pick everybody pickable, then those who don't want to take action today to be their turn to be, you know, to be picked. So I, I, I think uh, Richard Akinola uh, hit the nail on the head in talking about what the Guild of Editors and the Nigerian Union of Journalists should be doing. I, in my opinion, I think they should be front and center in all of this, address the issue frontally, talk to the government, because there is no basis for any of this. How do you, it doesn't make sense, how do you charge a journalist in a state for treason, for terrorism? Why? Somebody raises an issue about financial impropriety. And you, the next thing you do is to charge the person for treason. And you actually now, uh, what is the You actually take him to court. You're not just saying it, you, you're going through with that statement, you charge him to court, and you, the case is uh, going on as a treasonable offense case. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense, but, but uh, that's what we are confronted with and we really have to continue to talk about it and try to do something about it. Now, Mr. Chido, let me get your view on this. What should be done now as a countermeasure against uh, the government's concerted effort to throttle independent and free media? Well, that's a big one. Um, first of all, there is need for awareness. The Constitution enjoins citizens and enjoins journalists to do this because it's within their rights. The things they do, whether to keep the government uh, accountable, whether it's to inform other citizens, uh, that's a constitutional role that journalists have to play. Then when you talk about citizens, they also have a constitutional role to express themselves, to associate, to mingle and interact with other uh, citizens. So what do we do? What is to be done when we have a regime that appears to constrict uh, this freedom? Mm. 
There are a number of things we need to do. We need to awaken the consciousness of citizens to their rights. We need to allow, uh, let citizens know that they have a duty to protect. So uh, we have to, we can go to court, seek legal redress, we can protest, we can uh, draw attention to these issues, we can reach out to international organizations uh, that Nigeria belongs to, the treaties Nigerians have, Nigeria has signed to alert the global community about what's going on in the co country. But more importantly, I think we need to empower citizens in such a way that we can resist this attempt. So uh, we, we're going forward, I think citizens, that power that we've deployed several times, uh, both against uh, the military dictatorship and obnoxious policies in this country. So it, it may ultimately end in street matches and, uh, and so on. But there are a number of options open to us as citizens that uh, we need to we need to, including the media itself, you know, editorializing these issues, talking about them, uh, but also in very peaceful and coordinated manner, confront the authorities in such a way that uh, they would know that they can't do this and get away with it. Talking about consciousness, I yeah. remember a um, couple of weeks back you uh, you talked about the uh, the low rate of political consciousness among the students, considering uh, the antecedents of students during the military junta years uh, and the role they played, the agitations of the Nigerian students. You actually bemoan the lack of that uh, political consciousness. And um, what should be done now in order to raise that political consciousness among the students? As a matter of, uh, instead of uh, they are dittering over meaningless trivialities that they engaged in now. Well, I mean, people like to blame young people. You can partly blame them for their inactivity, so to say, you know, lack of engagement or involvement. Well, unfortunately, my generation and maybe the generation immediately following mine did not make any conscious effort to reproduce itself. Okay. So in a way, I think the blame, as much as we would love to blame young people, uh, you, you can also see that what's happening with them is a reflection of what's happening in the larger Nigerian society. Okay. There is an existential, serious existential crisis in the country. People will need to eat, people will need to... There is a collapse of public education, public health in the country. So young people, as university students, your duty is not just to go to school to read. Your part, if I'm more, the more important part of your duty is how to survive as a student on campus. You know, that's even for those who go to uh, public school. Uh, so it, it's a big challenge in the sense that a lot of things that young people have to confront with the, today, we didn't confront uh, these things when we were in the university. You know, you went to school uh, barely tuition free. Your bed was made for you. People swept your hostels. Uh, feeding was uh, uh, almost free. So you could concentrate on reading and doing activism. But now, a lot of students spend, because they want to manage and uh, stay in school, if it's a three-month semester, they, got, they might decide to stay half of the semester at home and feed at home and go to school for the remaining half. Uh, moving around these days, it's, it's difficult and challenging. So students and young people face this serious existential uh, threat, existential problem. But then it's always in the midst of this kind of crisis or threats that you also uh, see uh, how important it is for people to rise from this trouble and confront and say, how do we confront this menace that is keeping us down, that is uh, making us uh, less of citizens in our country. 
So, but they need the help of the older generation of Nigerians to, rather than just bemoan and criticize them. So, for an, like us, uh, for an organization like the African Center for Media and Information, we're doing a lot of things to help young people to conscientize them. We just finished uh, a two-day uh, workshop around that with the International Institute for Journalism in Abuja. Last year, we did something with students at the University of Abuja. And a lot of them were really keen. You could see the passion and interest. Again, to buttress the point of the existential crisis I talked about, it's not just even the state. What students face on campus, from their lecturers, from their VCs, it makes it so difficult. So today, almost you can count, I'm sure more than half of the universities don't have active uh, student union on campus. The VCs have banned and destroyed unionism, which essentially is the way you groom this generation of uh, activists. So we need to confront that. How do we ensure that we bring unionism uh, back to our campuses so that students can take active part in the political process on campus and hopefully when they get out, they continue uh, that. So the event we plan for Thursday, November 7, uh, one half of that event is to address this issue. Young people will be coming from campus journalists, uh, student leaders, youth from youth groups, and so on, will be coming from different parts of the country. They meet to uh, discuss these issues, look at the challenges, look at the opportunities that exist, and see how to confront it. Uh, you would have heard the case of uh, a student in Benue State. I think he was, uh, was it Benue or Taraba State? Now he was critical of the state governor and the VC. Uh, the VC, they expelled him, they withdrew his admission. So VCs are becoming more like dictators on, on campuses. Uh, campuses across the country. Almost reflect even of what's happening in the state and at the federal uh, level. So uh, this crisis is not just, it's multi-layered. And in confronting it, we have to be creative. We have to address it, address it at uh, each uh, layer that it occurs. So it, it, we have to look at it also, you know, generally and say it's not just a one size fit all problem in, in addressing how do we confront this issue at local level, at the campus level, at the state level, at the federal level. But more importantly, it, what it calls for is for mobilization, for people to consider the effort, for people to come together and say this is unacceptable. In a democratic society, in a democracy that we all fought for, people lost their lives, students died, were expelled, were rusticated, and some got missing till today. We don't know where they are. We won't allow any individual or group of individuals to take us for granted or to seize this space that we fought so dearly for. You slammed a uh, hundred billion uh, naira suit against the uh, DSS for. Yeah. A rights violation and unlawful detention. How's that case coming up? Most of our viewers will not want to know. Well, yeah, it's uh, interesting. The, of course, we all know what happened that arrived the country on uh, Sunday, September 29th, after being away for three weeks, and I was accosted by officers of uh, the State Security Service and kept in their office between the airport and their headquarters for about six hours. and. My T-shirt was seized and I was made to write an undertaking that I, would, uh, I wouldn't wear that T-shirt ever again. So uh, we thought we needed to also test the frontiers of human rights and so on in this country. And we did what, uh, as law-abiding citizens, we needed to do, which was to take the matter to court. We filed a case last week. Uh, there has not been any date for the hearing. I think the process is still on. The, once the chief judge uh, assigns the case to a court, the SSS will be served and hopefully they can now face 
uh, fix a date uh, for trial or hearing of the case. A number of people, well, quite a number of people have called or written or expressed their opinion that, yeah, it's a good thing to do. A few people have questioned, oh, why do you do this? Of course, you know the outcome. Well, you can't say because you know the outcome. You won't do what is expected of you as a citizen. Let's, we've done what we need to do. Let's wait. When we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. Let's see what the outcome uh, will be. But I think we did the right thing. Uh, I don't know uh, anywhere in the Constitution or any laws or even policies of this country where uh, somebody can be taken in for wearing a T-shirt and innocuous I mean, the word Biafra has not been banned in Nigeria. Yeah. You know, uh, we are all Biafra, which was the inscription on my T-shirt, is the title of my book. And I explained that uh, to them, and they weren't interested in, in that. But yeah, as I said, it seems, to, it seems as if we've moved from the era of where you'll be questioned for what you write or what you say. And uh, if you're unlucky, you are a young person, and you're depending on the clothes you wear or what kind of hairstyle you wear, or the laptop you're carrying or phone you're carrying, you could actually be stopped and detained uh, for uh, what you're carrying. Now we've moved to the era of what you're wearing. People could stop you and detain you uh, for what you're wearing. Uh, God forbid that we move to the stage where people will be detained for what they are thinking. <laughs> so you could actually, that somebody would come to your office and say, I know you're thinking this, then they put you in handcuffs and, really? you know, move you to... Wouldn't that be preposterous? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but yeah, there, there is no limit so, to when, when a dictatorship is un, un, unhinged, it unleashes all kinds of... Uh, Thing. So it's and when I say this, it seems amusing. People think, oh, but you know, we could actually have, uh, we could actually come to a situation where somebody will stop you on the road or come to your office and say, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this against the state. You're thinking this against this governor. You're thinking this against the president. Therefore, we have to take you in and uh, maybe do a scan and find that <laughs> exactly. Because it's uh, maybe to just chip in. A friend of mine, a sports journalist, uh, two weeks ago, he called me late at night. I was so tired I didn't pick the call. Then in the morning I woke up, turned my phone, and I saw a text from him saying, oh, bros, I've just been released. I'm like, so I immediately called him back. He said, ah, when I called you last night, you know, there is this place in Ikeja that we normally hang out in the evening. I said, yeah, I said, what happened? He said, I parked my vehicle there and around 11 o'clock, I saw some men vandalizing my vehicle and I walked out of the drinking place, walked towards them. Immediately, they just arrested me, bundled me and threw me inside this truck. And we about, they had in all about 25 people. They took them to the area air for somewhere I'm not familiar with that and it was until the police, uh, it wasn't until the police commissioner, the Lagos State uh, Police Commissioner came around 8 a.m. the following day that they were released and he said people were paying 10, 15,000 to be released. Much later at about 1 a.m. said they brought even ladies, more people came in they just did this random. So it's at every level you, you, you see a dangerous precedent in terms of the ability for people to move around, for ability for people. So law enforcement is doing it for financial reasons, is doing it for many other reasons. Now we are uh, facing the issue of uh, positive, uh, what do they call it again, positive identification. Mm -hmm. By the, the military. military. By the military. <laughs> in uh, this festive period in a country where mobility is uh, such a challenge, uh, there are not uh, many places you can actually get proper identification. The driver's license thing is a mess. 
the national ID card. There are those who have applied for five, eight years. Some have temporary ones, others don't. I mean, if you want to do this, I think we're putting the cart before the horse. There are a number of things, and if you look at the different societies around the world, so people could have local government identification, state identification, then federal identification, if that is easy for you. So any local government, you are in Alimosha local government, for example, you reside there. All you need to do is to go to the local government and show uh, your Nepal, PhD, and bill, bill or some other bill that you reside there, and you get an identification. So there will be no anybody, that will be the identification uh, you use. But rather than, now, rather than do that, rather than ensure that the national identification process works very well. We are, you know, it, it seems that we've not gotten over this whole military mentality in this country. We, we still, a lot of the things happening in this country is still a hangover from the military era. So the military is everywhere. Our society is one of the most militarized in, in the world. The military is everywhere. Uh, civic, simple matter that the police would deal with, they will call in the military checkpoints, you have the military uh, and so on. So uh, we really need to win ourselves of this military uh, uh, thing. I think... But, but, but even at that, uh, Kriyo Indulgence, even at that, even then, Nigerians had a, a sitting outrage over what was happening. But now one begins to wonder, where is that collective outrage, that kind of Anger among Nigerians, isn't it? It's difficult? there, if you ask me. It's there. It's the, perhaps why it's not, uh, it doesn't appear so visible is that uh, also the country is more divided today okay. than, it ever. Ha, than it has ever been. And I've written about this. I've mentioned that, except perhaps during the Civil War, I have not uh, seen and I've lived through many military administrations, uh, been... I've uh, seen a number of civilian administration and been following the Nigerian crisis, uh, studying Nigeria and so on. I, I don't remember any time we've had this country this polarized. Right. So there, there is a sense in which it's, you only hear one half of that outrage. The other half Interestingly, the other half is also not silent. It appears to try to counter this outrage at every opportunity it gets, you know, for whatever reason. You know. so, but I think the outrage is the, uh, what we have is this polarization and division. And essentially, an attempt instead of focusing on the problem, there is so much bickering on that polarization. So people are fighting one another on social media, in the mainstream media, and so on, rather than focusing on the problem. So I, I think it's unfortunate, but that's uh, the situation we found ourselves. People need to continue you know, to push, uh, explore, expand the frontiers of our democratic uh, uh, freedom. Whatever it is, it definitely can last uh, forever. I'm confident about that. Finally, yeah. how can press freedom rebound from these things of uh, repression? Well, it's about citizens' power. The journalists themselves have to be alive to their responsibility. You will see a lot of uh, self-censorship now. The m private television and radio stations are the big culprits here. Everybody seems to be beholden to the states or beholden to big businesses and so on. Uh, even though I agree that media is business, they have to survive and so on. But we can also do a number of things. Because at the end of the day, if we don't have a society, that's what I keep telling people. If this country collapses tomorrow, you can't do your media business. You can't run your TV station. You can't run your newspaper house and so on. So it's important while we're 
aiming to keep our businesses afloat, while we are aiming to make money from our businesses, to also be concerned about where this country is headed. If Nigeria implodes, and I keep saying it, it's not just about the media and press freedom, it's about big business. Thank you.